Hi y'all. So this is episode two of my Not Forsaken podcast. Um, I'm Jennifer Greenberg. I'm the author of the book Not Forsaken, which is a story of life after abuse. So one of the things I like to talk about in my podcast, of course, is, um, well, life after abuse, uh, recovering from trauma, coping with depression and anxiety, how to build healthy relationships, and how to understand sin and recovery in light of the gospel. Um, I'm going to start out this first episode, I, or sorry, second episode now. Um, I wanted to show you some of the books I've been reading. Um, right now, I am very slowly making my way through God Breathed, God Breathed by Rhett Etheridge. And um, Rhett is a friend of mine on Facebook, and he and I email back and forth occasionally. Um, but he is, he's absolutely brilliant. Um, if you are interested in philosophy um, uh, and how, how secular philosophy um, maybe contradicts or, um, uh, what's the word, uh, competes, I guess, with biblical uh, theology and Christian philosophy, um, and also just how do we know that um, that God is real? How do we know that that we are designed to worship, that we are made in the image of God? And so God Breathed, if you're interested in that topic, God Breathed is a fascinating book. Um, I have a severe case of squirrel brain, and it is just taking me forever to get through it, but that is nothing against the author. He's, he's a brilliant writer and he's very fun and friendly. Um, it's an easy read. Uh, I just, for whatever reason, I don't know, like it's weird. I can sit down and I can write books and I can write for hours on end. But if you ask me to sit down and read a book, um, it's like every five minutes my mind is flitting to other places. Um, another thing that I'm really excited about, another book I'm really excited about, I haven't read this yet, um, but this is, I got this in the mail. It's a gift from a friend. Um, and it is from, by Diana Groover and it is Companions in the Darkness. I don't know if you can see that how beautiful this cover is. It's dark and there's like sparkles of teal and gold in it. It's just a beautiful book. Um, but it's seven, seven saints who struggled with depression and doubt. And um, so basically she just, I mean, it looks like an absolutely lovely book. It says, for centuries, the church assumed that depression was evidence of personal sin or even demonic influence. The depressed have often been ostracized or institutionalized. In recent years, the conversation has begun to change and the stigma has lessened. But as anyone who suffers from depression knows, we still have a long way to go. In Companions in the Darkness, Diana Groover looks back into church history and finds depression and the doubt and spiritual darkness that often go along with it in the lives of some of our most beloved saints, including Martin Luther, Charles Spur Spurgeon, Mother Teresa, and Martin Luther King Jr. So I am very excited about reading this book. Thank you, Diana, so much for the gift. Um, I believe it's available for pre-order, so if that sounds like something that's of interest to you, I will make sure when I read it, um, again, squirrel brain, um, but when I read it, I will be sure to review that on my blog and, and talk about it again in my podcast. Anyway, so uh, moving on to the, the main body of this episode, one thing that I'm doing with, with uh, the Not Forsaken podcast is I'm actually asking you questions um, and for suggestions um, topic-wise. So you may have noticed a couple days ago, I posted on Twitter and Facebook asking what I should talk about next. And I got a lot of wonderful responses and I'm gonna get to quite a few of those. But um, one that stuck out to me and one that is very relevant to me, oh, there's Guinevere. Mama. What baby? Mama. This is Guinevere. My baby girl. What you need, baby? Uh, but wait, doesn't... I just... 
I haven't drawn you Wonder Woman yet, no. I haven't drawn her yet. After I'm finished recording my podcast, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna draw you a picture of Wonder Woman, okay? I did that not that. You didn't mean that? You want me to do it right now? Uh-huh. Go watch your show and drink your chocolate milk and I will be out in a few minutes. I'm not cut her out. Oh, you want me to cut her out, okay. After I'm finished recording, I will come and cut her out, okay? Okay. Now go on, close the door, please. Anyway, so one of the questions that really um, struck me personally uh, was, was this one. And so I wanna focus the episode today on answering this question in five different ways. Um, so the question is, how do we learn to distinguish abusive and toxic people from good but sinful or flawed people? Let me read that again. How do we learn to distinguish abusive and toxic people from good but sinful or flawed people? Now, I imagine most people would be interested in knowing the answer to this question. Um, me personally, as an abuse survivor, this is extremely relevant, especially I think as a child abuse survivor, because I I was taught for so long um, that love involved things like jealousy and manipulation and control. If someone loved you, they wanted to micromanage you and they wanted to, um, they wanted to limit who you had contact with because, you know, they didn't want you to, um, I don't know, have, have any replacement or, or relationships outside your relationship with them. And so it was very, love was a very poss possessive thing. And, um, you know, as I've, as I've gotten out of that relationship, um, and, and gotten more used to godly relationships, Christian relationships, um, I've become more used to, to healthy love and I've become acquainted with what love really is, um, both practically speaking, uh, but also from a biblical perspective. In fact, actually, a um, little self-promo here, but if you get my book, Not Forsaken, um, there's an entire chapter on defining love and what healthy love looks like. That's chapter 13. Um, I'll just flip to it really quick. Whoops, let's see. Defining Love 201. Um, and so in this chapter, what I did, Defining Love, uh, I, I actually first, the first, when I first started writing this book, I was going to call this chapter, What is Love? But then a bunch of people started like teasing me on Twitter about it. So I changed it to Defining Love. But so we, I, what I did was I went through the different descriptors of love in the Bible. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Um, love does not boast. Love is not proud or arrogant. Love is not rude or dishonoring of others. Um, love is not irritable or easily angered. Love does not insist on its own way. Um, love does not delight in evil or rejoice at wrongdoing. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Wow. I mean, if you're, if you're an abuse survivor, I'm guessing like me that that really shouts to you. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So every time your, um, you know, abuser brought up mistakes in your past, every time they insisted on their own way, every time they were easily angered, um, they bragged, they were proud or arrogant. Um, they were jealous and envious. They were not demonstrating real love. But of course, you know, especially as someone who grew up in a broken home and an abusive home, um, my definition of love was very warped. It was warped by abuse. I mean, so I didn't know how to distinguish someone who loved me from someone who loved the way I made them felt feel about themselves, right? Um, I didn't know how to distinguish someone who loved me from someone who loved controlling me and loved the power trip that that gave them. And so learning how to discern an abusive or toxic person from a good but sinful person um, is a big deal uh, for, for abuse survivors in particular, but really just people in general. 
So my first answer to this question is that we need to learn to acclimate ourselves. We need to learn to get used to being around good, healthy, godly people and enjoying good, healthy, and godly relationships. Um, I was talking to a friend uh, last week, actually, about this very topic. Like before this question was asked, um, I was talking to a friend about it, and she was saying, she told me, you know what? Um, when they when a bank trains bank tellers, the way they do it is by giving them lots of real money to handle. Okay, um, they want to teach them to spot counterfeits, but the way they do that is they give them real money authentic money and so they practice counting that money and handling that money and flipping through that money and they get so used to handling real money that's genuine that's authentic that when they come across a counterfeit uh, bill they notice because it feels different there's something there's something that looks different about it they might not spot the exact detail they may not um, notice exactly what it is that tips them off to that counterfeit money but they notice it right off the bat and they start taking a closer look and I think in our relationships and in how we deal with people I think I think that's a great analogy we need to get used to being around good people and godly people so that when we do encounter someone who is not godly and and isn't interested in having that healthy Christian, genuine Christian, I'm not just talking about like fake Christian, I'm talking about genuine Christian uh, relationship with us, um, we notice. We may not be able to put our finger on it exactly. We may not be able to point to an exact detail of, okay, this person did this and therefore they're an abuser. We feel the difference and it clicks and we start looking closer at that person and their behavior and their relationship with us. So that's my first advice in response to this question. My second advice is that we need to align our will with God's will align our will with God's will. Um, what does that mean exactly? Well, we need to have a heart um, that that loves unselfishly, that loves self-sacrificingly. Um, we need to be genuine ourselves. And, you know, like Christ, uh, when he was uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, he was he was about to go through the biggest trial of his life. And when we talk about the biggest trial in Jesus' life, that's a big deal because he's eternal, right? So he was about to be crucified and he was praying to God, you know what, God, this, this is my father. This is a really horrible way to die. Please take this cup from me. Take this trial away from me, but not my will but yours be done. And that's a really important um, attitude. Hopefully you are not, you and I will never encounter a trial that horrific. But nevertheless, that's a good way to model our mindset. You know what, God, let me get this new job. Please, please let me get this new job. But you, you know what, not my will, but yours be done. If you've got a better, different plan for me, something that will uh, facilitate your kingdom better. You know what? Not my will, but yours be done. Um, you know what? Lord, please, please make me a better parent. Help me to be more, more organized. Help me to get my house clean. Help me to get my kids to school on time. Help me to be better at helping them with their homework. But you know what? Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Because if it if, if it helps my kids, if it works towards the salvation of my children to watch me repent over and over for my, my, my sins, my mistakes, then you know what? Lord, use my, my flaws to glorify you. Use my flaws and my repentance to save my children. So this is the mindset of a genuine believer. This is a mindset of someone who is aligning their will with God's will. And the thing is, when we align our will with God's will, again, it's like that bank teller analogy. We're going to notice when we encounter someone whose will is not aligned with God's. Maybe they're doing good things, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. They have ulterior motives. Maybe they say friendly things to us to our face, but then they talk bad about other people. And we start to think, well... 
is this person, you know, they say nice things to me, but then they say nasty things about our mutual friends. Maybe they're not, you know, as, as friendly as they seem. Um, so when we align our will with God's will, we're going to notice, maybe not right away, maybe not perfectly, but we're going to notice when, when something's off with someone, hopefully. Um, my, my third advice is to practice identifying the fruit of the Spirit. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Well, we find them in Galatians 5, 19 through 26. And I, I say 19 through 26. I could zoom in on the actual fruit of the Spirit, and I will for this podcast, but I want you to go and look up the entire verse, Galatians 5, 19 through 26, because in it, he also talks about the fruit of the flesh, the fruit of this world. That includes envy, jealousy, dissension, division, lust, things of these of this nature, okay? And the list goes on and on, right, for the fruit of the flesh. It's like an endless list because the, the depravity, the sin, um, the wickedness of the human heart. I mean, if we were going to make a list of all the bad things people do, we would, I would never be able to finish this podcast. And Paul's letter to the Galatians would be as long as the entire Bible. So Galatians 5, 19 through 26, but he lists those fruit of the spirit. And this is what I want us to focus on today. Practice IDing consistent patterns, not just one-off events, right? Not just, um, not just things they do when people are watching or things they claim they're doing on Twitter, okay? Um, I want us to practice identifying patterns of behavior, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, grace, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, so these are things that should inundate our lives. They should soak into our lives as believers because if we're, if we're genuine Christians, we've got the Holy Spirit in our hearts and, and the love of God and the goodness of God and the compassion and mercy of God should be seeping out into our whole mindset, into our souls, and it should be shining out through everything that we do. Okay, that's not to say that we're never going to get jealous. We're never going to envy. We're never going to say something stupid on Twitter. We're never going to badmouth somebody. Yes, we sin. We're still human beings. We're not in heaven yet, right? But when we do sin, we repent of those sins and we work on those sins and we pray to God to please, um, you know, fix this sin in us because we can't. We can't do it on our own because we are fallen, flawed beings. So practice IDing that fruit of the spirit because what's going to happen is, you know, maybe so, for example, um, you know, I can look at uh, my, you know, an abuser and, and I can say, you know what, once in a while he or she said some nice things. They, uh, once in a while they were compassionate. I remember that one time that, that my dad said he was sorry to me, but you know what, that's not a pattern of behavior. That's not, or at least that's not the pattern of behavior that predominantly defines their life, their personality, their lifestyle, okay? It's not, um, it's not the first thing that comes to mind when you think about them. And you know, there are a lot of abusers, particularly psychological abusers, narcissists, like we talked about in the last episode, they slip in because they look so much like real Christians, but they're counterfeits, right? So we need to, you know, be slow about where's shadow facts. I don't know. Can you go find him? I don't know where he is. He's probably taking a nap in the spare room, sweetheart. Shadow facts is our cat. Okay, so practice identifying those fruits of the spirit so that when we encounter someone who maybe once in a while or while they're in public or while they're behind the pulpit, you know, kind of has counterfeit fruits of the spirit. But once we get to know that person, we kind of notice, okay, this is not, this is not actually a pattern in their life. Um, it's not 
something that I'm consistently seeing from them. I'm seeing more fruits of the flesh, less fruits of the spirit. <clears throat> and most of all, I think when, um, when we confront a genuine Christian with their sin, yes, it may hurt their feelings. Yes, it may bruise their ego, but ultimately they're going to admit they've committed sin and they're going to repent of that sin. Whereas an abuser, more often than not, is going to dig in their heels and make excuses and refuse to repent and refuse to change. Change is a major part of repentance, okay? it's When I say repentance, I'm not just talking about saying, I'm sorry. I'm talking about a, a change in their, in their pattern of behavior, a change in their life, and a willingness even to say, you know what? If, if I'm damaging to you, if I'm triggering you, if I'm stressing you out because I've hurt you in this regard, I'm going to back out of your life. I'm going to give you this space to heal because I love you. And sometimes loving someone means, means giving them space, right? Sometimes loving someone means, um, uh, you know, recognizing that, yes, my presence in this person's life is, is harmful to them because I'm reminding them of a, of a of a of something bad that I did or maybe a dark season in their in their life and for for their sake um for their peace of mind I'm going to step back. Um that is a self-sacrificing thing to do. It is not a controlling thing to do. Um when we see someone who maybe claims to be sorry but they demand forgiveness, they demand your trust, that's controlling. And so that should be a red flag to us. My fourth advice is to beware of common red flags. And going back to Galatians 5, 19 through 26, a lot of these are included in that list of the flesh. Um, gossip, jealousy, vanity, pride, um, controlling or obsessive behavior. You know, we can take the, the list too of the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, grace, gentleness, and self-control. If you just look up those words in the thesaurus, look at the antonyms of those words, basically you get a list that describes an abuser, okay? So you're, you know, you're looking for someone who, or when you, rather, when you see someone who, who talks bad about people, who gossips, um, who is jealous, um, envious, prideful, vain, um, and I'm not just talking, like I said in the last episode, I'm not just talking about physical vanity. I'm talking about someone who maybe thinks they're smarter than everybody else, right? Or who um, who views their PhD or their academia or their knowledge of the Bible as being something that makes them kind of a super Christian. And, you know, they're... Uh, they're, they're a man of God or a woman of God. And if you question them, you're going against God, you know? So that pride, huge red flag, huge, huge, huge red flag. So, but again, you know, these are flags. They're not a diagnosis, okay? They're not a condemnation of that person. They're a red flag. They're a warning sign, okay? So when we see these red flags, what it means is we need to step back, we need to look at this person objectively. We need to look at our relationship with them objectively, and we need to be careful, okay? We need to be careful about um, not idolizing this person, not trusting them too much or in an unwise manner. Um, we need to uh, be able to objectively reflect, okay, are we... You know, these uh, we thought this person was a Christian, but maybe we need to go back and we need to analyze those past conversations and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing some bad patterns here, and maybe you need to confront that person. Maybe you need to, um, you know, ask someone else for help in confronting them. Um, I, for one, would never encourage, particularly if you're if you're an abuse victim. Um, never confront a dangerous person by yourself, you know, and if you catch someone in um, a lifestyle of lies and gossip in particular, um, it's wise to bring a witness with you so that if this person um, continues in their ways, continues in their lies, it's not just you against them. It's not he said, she said, you've got that witness there. That's a biblical concept. Um, the fifth 
the fifth suggestion I would say, and again, just to remind us, our original question that we're trying to answer here is, how do we learn to distinguish abusive, toxic people from good but sinful and flawed people? So my fifth, my fifth word of advice here is trust your gut. And this is the one that I really struggle with because as an abuse survivor, I don't want to be paranoid. I don't want to see abuse everywhere. I'm, I guess you could say I'm paranoid about being paranoid. That's, or anxious about being anxious. That's not a good place to be. Um, but so, so what ends up happening is, you know, we, we've had these traumatic experiences. We've had big, th bad things happen to us. We've, we've encountered bad people. We've suffered through bad relationships. And then we come across this person who, you know, they don't seem too bad, right? They seem like a good person. Maybe they're, maybe they're a brilliant preacher. Maybe they're a, um, a calm counselor. Maybe they're just a really faithful friend who, um, you know, texts us every day and calls us on the phone and checks in on us to see how we're doing. But something is off. Something is bugging us and we can't put our finger on it, but you know, and we're worried that we're just being paranoid, but at the same time, we don't feel quite comfortable. Don't force yourself to trust someone, okay? For one thing, it's just not healthy. It's not a good way to teach yourself to trust, right? Um, trust is something that needs to be earned. It needs to be established over a period of time. Um, we don't just trust someone because they've got a master in divinity, we don't just trust someone because they've got a counseling degree. We don't just trust someone because on Twitter they say they're an abuse survivor advocate, right? Um, we trust someone because we have experience with this person. We trust them because um, not only do they say they're a good person or a smart person or an educated person, but we see that working out in their life. We see them helping people. We see them helping us. We see them repenting of their sins. That's really important. And again, it's not just I'm sorry. It's a change in behavior. Okay, everybody sins. I sin. I will let you down. I promise you. Um, and so, but when I let you down, um, I want to repent of that sin. I want to admit it. When I make a mistake, I want to correct my mistake. I want to make amends if I need to. Um, you know, so, so anytime, you know, like if I say something on Twitter, I say something on Facebook, if you come to me and you say, Hey, Jen, you know, this tweet, this post, something you said in your podcast just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And I'm, I'm not sure what you meant. So, so I want to talk to you about it and, and see what you say. Um, and I want to be the person who repents of that, that thing, whatever it may be. It, well, I'll repent if it's a sin. Um, if it's if it's just a mistake or a misunderstanding, I'll say I'm sorry, right? I'll apologize um, and try to clarify my mistake for the future and and try to avoid making it again, right? So, but again, back to my point, trust your gut. If someone rubs you the wrong way, makes you feel anxious and insecure, this is a big one for me. Um, this one has tripped me up a bunch of times where, you know, it's like I, I trust someone, I, I view them as as a role model, I view them as a wise counselor, but every time I talk to them, I just come, I come away feeling, feeling anxious and feeling bad about myself and feeling insecure. And I think that's a, that's a big red flag um, because someone who is rooted in the gospel of grace should be building you up in Christ. And I, I'm not saying that they should be telling you how wonderful you are, but they should be pointing you to Jesus. You know, even if you're, even if you're struggling with a terrible sin, you know, like maybe, maybe you cheated on your spouse. Maybe you, um, maybe you, uh, lied to someone. Maybe in the past you had an abortion. Maybe you, um, maybe you, you didn't sin, but you just gave up, you gave up your child for adoption because you just weren't ready as a teenager, um, to be a parent yet, and you just feel terrible about these things. Well, when you come to a pastor or a counselor or or me or or an, any other Christian, um, if they start making you just feel awful about yourself, 
um, instead of pointing you to Christ, pointing to you to redemption, pointing you to the God of our salvation, right? He doesn't just atone for our sins. He makes up for every failing we've ever had. He loves us. He um, he is preparing a place for us in heaven where everything we've ever done wrong, whether that be a mistake, whether it be a misunderstanding, whether it be sin, whether it be a terrible evil, he's he's making a place for us and he's making us perfect. And he's he is our righteousness. He fulfilled the law to such a degree. He lived a perfect life um, for us. So that our imperfect life would be viewed as perfect by God the Father. Um, that is what Jesus has done for us. And if someone, if you, if, you, if you talk about your life with someone and you come away feeling more insecure or anxious or just being around that makes you nervous, I would say that's a big red flag that either that person's just not healthy for you right now. You know, maybe they're a genuine person genuine Christian, but for whatever reason, they're just not, they're not helping you uh, spiritually grow. Um, but, uh, you know, more than that, this is a red flag that you might be dealing with someone who is not pointing you to the gospel, who's not pointing you to Christ. And of course, as a Christian, as Christians, that's, that's problematic. Um, and finally, you don't owe anyone your trust. Okay. Um, again, trust is something that is earned. It's not something that people can demand from you. It's not something that they can buy from you. Um, one helpful kind of litmus test, I guess, that that I as a parent often ask myself is, um, okay, I have this friend who I'm not sure if I trust them or not. Should I tell them about this issue that I'm struggling with or should I not? Well, a good litmus test for me has been would I trust this person to babysit my child? Would I trust this person to teach my kid? Um, if the answer is no, if I wouldn't trust my child with that person, then I shouldn't trust my heart with that person. Simple as that. Um, you know, I, you know, obviously not all of you have kids. Maybe some of you are single. Um, well, would you trust this person to manage your finances? Would you trust this person with your social security number? Would you, um, you know, it just ask some pr practical questions like that. Um, because if you wouldn't trust this person in, um, you know, with your money, why would you trust them with your soul? If you wouldn't trust this person with your, uh, your, your, your identification, your personal ID, your social security or what, whatnot, why would you trust them with your heart? So, you know, trust, again, it's something that is very special. Um, if someone demands your trust or shames you for not trusting them, that's a sign that they're not trustworthy and that you made a good call. So in closing, again, the question was, how do we learn to discern abusive and toxic people from good but sinful and flawed people? And I'm just going to run through these really quickly. One, acclimate to being around good, healthy, and godly people and enjoying godly relationships. Acclimate yourself to healthiness. Two, align your will with God's will. Because when we align our will with God's will, it's going to be easier for us to notice when someone else is not aligned with God's will. Three, practice identifying the fruit of the spirit. Identify it both in yourself, but also in other people. And you know what? This is a good way to build our friends up, right? So I can, you know, talk to my husband, Jason, and say, you know what? I've really noticed that, you know, you're really growing in compassion. You've always been a loving guy, but you're really growing in compassion. And I really appreciate that about you. Um, so practice identifying those fruits of the spirit. Um, four, beware of common red flags, gossip, jealousy, vanity and pride, controlling and obsessive behavior. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Again, those are red flags, not a diagnosis. And finally, five, trust your gut. Um, God gave you your instincts. And granted, we can't read hearts, 
but when when our gut is telling us not to trust someone when our gut is telling us something's off about someone it's wise to step back and evaluate that person and go back through those first four steps and evaluate your relationship and evaluate their behavior um, this is not judgmental it's wisdom it's discernment, you know? If you read the book of Proverbs, it's all about learning to discern good things from bad things, good people from bad people. And when I say good people, I don't mean actual good people in and of themselves. I mean good because they're depending on Christ for their goodness. So I hope this podcast encourages you. Um, I hope it benefits you as you as you learn to, to discern between um abusive and toxic people and and healthy and godly people. And I hope that I take this podcast to heart as well, because this is something that I struggle with. And you know what, if you struggle with this, if you're an abuse survivor and you struggle with these things, or you feel like, you know, you keep trusting all the wrong people and you get betrayed over and over, take heart. It is not your fault. Um, you should never feel ashamed of being a loving person. You should never feel ashamed for being hopeful. Go to the bathroom. Close the door, please. So never be ashamed of being loving um, and trusting people. And, and just recognize that, you know, their sin, their betrayal is their sin. And it's not yours. So yes, we can learn to uh, grow in discernment and to grow in wisdom. But... We're not Jesus. We can't read hearts. And so don't don't be too hard on yourself. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in and I will, you know, follow this up with another episode in the comments if you would ask questions and bring up topics that you would like me to address in future episodes. And, you know, I'll see you on Facebook, on Twitter. Please follow me and please subscribe to uh, my channel so that you can get updated when I have more episodes. And um, anyway, y'all have a blessed week. And thank you so much for your time today. Bye.